Good morning, everyone. Number one, thanks for joining us here today, and welcome to a CI Chit Chat out on the road here and a uh, bit of morning, <laughs> but uh, but excited to be here and uh, share some updates with you all. Actually, a lot of pretty exciting things kind of going on, which has been good. So um, this this CI Chit Chat where we're talking about carbon intensity, carbon intensity scores, and I've got a special guest on here today, Blaine. Uh, Blaine's our VP of sales. Blaine, you've been on before, I guess. Um, just, this is uh, my second episode. Your second episode. So if you've, uh, uh, we got more of Blaine's background and stuff previously. Um, but yeah, Blaine helps run our, our sales team and uh, interact with a lot of farmers uh, through that. Um, so a couple different things I wanted to maybe hit on here to begin with. Let me fix this. Maybe that'll be better. Um. So, uh, number one, I'd like to always start off, you know, with what's going on in DC. So carbon intensity is important because, or what's really pushing this carbon intensity thing forward is the 45 Z tax credit, right? And 45 Z was part of the inflation reduction act passed into law over two years ago. And it's still due to start January one. There's still been no indication of anything otherwise, but we still don't have the rules. However, there's a lot of chatter here over the last week about progress actually being made in D.C., which is really encouraging because uh, it was very unknown there for a long time. And it was, you know, with the election and stuff, it was really looking like there wasn't a whole lot of progress being made. But here uh, over the last week, there has been uh, multiple different, um, you know, indications and stuff of things going on. Uh, and progress being made. So specifically to that, uh, there was a uh, some White House correspondence and stuff uh, talking about the Biden's, Biden administration's push to get some policy done. And namely, they were talking like climate policy, Inflation Reduction Act type stuff. But the only piece that was specifically named in the materials that I saw was 45Z, which is super encouraging. So they're like, hey, Biden people working on a bunch of these different programs and getting rules done specifically 45 Z. So that's encouraging, but it was saying rules by inauguration, right? January 20th, not necessarily by December 31st. So hopefully there's some stuff by December 31st because technically by law, there's supposed to be some stuff done by December 31st, but uh, you know, if it's 20, 21 days later, we'll, we'll take it. Uh, we'll take whatever, whatever uh, indications come. And I do think that, you know, this administration, uh, I feel like they're encouraged to get the job done, keep the ball rolling. They've spent, you know, a couple of years, uh, putting in a lot of work to try to get this pulled together. And they've done a lot of research and asked for a lot of public comment, gotten a lot of feedback and, uh, all they're doing at this point is publishing the preliminary rules. It's not the final thing, but at least by inauguration, get the preliminary rules out there. That'll start the 60 day public comment period. I don't know if they can extend that or what some of the uh, restrictions are around that, or if it can be paused right away. I don't know, but at least if they can publish some preliminary rules, we can start providing feedback. Trump's people come in and we can help them uh, to set the final rules and, try to not have things be delayed even further. So uh, hoping for some solid clarity to at least allow us to continue to move the needle forward with scoring bushels like Blaine, you were talking, getting bushels verified, getting our data organized, like knowing, are we going to use the greet model? We sure hope so. Uh, is this going to be book and claim or is it going to be some kind of a mass balance um, system? We sure hope it's book and claim. Uh, you know, what are some of those core components of the rules uh knowing that okay they could change but we still feel confident that getting some preliminary rules out there uh gives us some additional talking points to work with trump's folks on and give them feedback and help them to put together some final rules in a in a timely manner versus not having anything done by january 20th and trump's people basically starting from scratch so i don't know bland any uh thoughts on that or no i think from your side I think it's great to touch on Mitchell of just how you go through a lame duck 
presidency and administration right now. But I, I think it's a valid point that if you've worked on something for a very long time, that they're going to want to shore this up and, and get it as close to the finish line as possible before the Trump administration comes in. Um, I sure hope so. I sure uh, hope so. I think that's just pretty normal, though, when we have a switch in administration. Like, obviously, they could kind of drag their feet, but it doesn't sound like you're getting a lot of indication or hearing that out in the woodwork, too. So I think that's pretty encouraging. Another piece um, specifically on that, I was at a conference in Chicago last week. It was a nice event. I was only able to attend one day of the three-day conference, but it was about – scope three quantification and carbon accounting in agricultural supply chains. And I was the closing keynote of it. I'll, I'll share some insights from that here next, but uh, that final day of the event, they started it off with um, a gal from USDA. She works for Bill Hohenstein and his uh, in the, uh, the farm side of things. Um, and she's, she was talking about all the different work that they've been doing and highlighting different things that have happened, of course, throughout the administration. And uh, she specifically was talking about some of the ongoing work that's being done, some committees that are being put together, uh, some rules that are coming out. The Climate Smart Commodity Grants, of course, she was she was uh, highlighting. But she specifically noted the 45Z rules that they are working on as well. And the feedstock, they don't call it the 45Z rules. At USDA, they call it their rule on uh, feedstock or quantification of the carbon intensity of feedstocks for biofuel production. Um, because they're trying to make a rule that's more holistic than only for 45Z, right? So she was talking about that rule, and I point blank asked her, hey, that rule that you referred to, is it going to be done by January? Or what are the odds that it's going to be done by January? And of course, she uh, she gave a very political answer and didn't answer the question. But what she said wasn't, oh, no, that, that's just not going to be done. You know, the odds are low, which I thought she was maybe going to say that, like, eh. I don't know if 45, you know, I don't know if that rule is going to get done by, by January, you know, uh, we'll see. No, her response was, oh yeah, we're working really hard on that. There's a lot of good progress being made. So that was encouraging. Plus, like I said, some of the correspondence coming out of the white house and uh, yeah, feeling some good, good momentum there. So we still, of course, don't know what the final rules will be, but gosh, if we can get some, some clarity on, you know, how some of the rules are being put together. And again, uh, be able to not be set back by progress. I think that'll be good. And also just a lot of chatter too about this 45Z being bipartisan. Um, obviously there's a lot of conversations got to be had with Trump's people. He is very clearly going to cut a lot of different programs and roll back a lot of stuff, but uh, all the indications are that 45Z won't be one of those things that gets cut. And now of course we'll see what happens. Uh, but I think there's enough solid uh, ends there that it'll be okay. But Blaine, great anything point. else on that? No, great point. I just, I, I guess it, it doesn't make me too nervous, I guess, just with Trump's rhetoric on energy and energy independence too. And, yeah. and, and just from what he's indicated on farm support. And, you know, I, I, I just think it's something that's not going to get rolled back. And like you said, when you have something that's this strong of bipartisan support, has been looked to be extended to and talked about being extended for another 10 years. It's been thrown out there. I think that's a pretty good indication that we're going to have some legs to this too. Totally agree. And um, a couple other indications on that too, with uh, you know, obviously this is going to help on his energy policy and on uh, you know, being able to stimulate, you know, middle America, rural economies, ag economy, biofuel economy, lower uh, energy costs and stuff but do it with tax credits rather than government direct government spending. Right. So I think that plays to their stuff as well. Now, the other side of the coin on that too, is especially with Kennedy, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. coming in and with uh, on his side in his interest in regenerative ag, I think we can really explain to them and, and have a zero on, Hey, here's how you can really help more farms adopt cover crops and no-till and more more soil health-minded systems, but also with one of the uh, front runners for Secretary of Ag, at least, maybe maybe the front runner, uh, Jimmy Emons, our, a good buddy of ours, a guy that has spoken at our conference and stuff before, he thoroughly gets regenerative ag, of course, and soil health, uh, but also thoroughly gets the 45Z piece. And I've had a lot of great conversations with him about how big of an impact that this is going to have, and so uh, really hoping that our boy Jimmy can keep making some progress or two on this, on the secretary of ag front. 
uh, that would just be tremendous for this whole movement. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, to be able to have some of these guys that, that do care about the farm piece of things that care about soil health and for them to be in some positions of pretty high power, uh, could be a big, big deal. So we'll be watching that very closely. Yeah. Great point. Somebody that's tying really the economics of the farm to soil health to and understand yep. connections. So he gets know, it. Be I want to, I want to hit on another thing, uh, and then we can kind of shift gears a little bit. Another uh, quick update. So I mentioned this uh, conference in Chicago. I was the final closing keynote. And um, there was actually a couple of us farmers that spoke that day. Brandon Honeycutt, uh, he's over in, he's a farmer over in Nebraska. Uh, Kelly Garrett, who uh, we've had in on some of our stuff, farms in Western Iowa. Uh, Temple Rhodes, he's also tied in with Extreme Ag and he's out in Maryland. So all four of us spoke on the final day of the conference, which was really great. But uh, I gave the final closing keynote and my talk was about kind of our farm soil health journey and then our journey looking into how do we help to decarbonize the supply chains and how do we tell our story with different carbon programs or, or what have you. And I was explaining where I think the puck is going here, right? Away from carbon offsets, more towards carbon insetting slash carbon intensity. And I really see those as being kind of one of the same or being combined at some point where today a lot of the carbon inset programs they're still looking at the farmer payment or the farmer quantification being in terms of tons of carbon abated or uh, tons of CO2 equivalent. But in reality, uh, it could be all the way down to the bushels, actual carbon footprint or your, you know, hundred weight of milk or your uh, pound of beef or whatever you're producing for the supply chain, quantifying the footprint per actual unit of outcome. And uh, was in conversations there with the likes of Mars and Coca-Cola, groups like that that were in the room and coming up to me afterwards and wanting to talk. And they actually do it. Are, they actually are really working towards quantifying their scope three carbon footprint and doing their carbon accounting more in line with carbon intensity versus carbon insetting, which was really encouraging. Now, they pointed out the GREET model is not one of these approved tools for some of these global uh, schemes, right? Greenhouse gas protocols and stuff uh, to which I'd say you need to continue to improve these systems. The GREET model is far from perfect, but there are other tools that they're doing too. None of them are perfect. So, hey, takes pages out of the 45Z playbook and uh, leverage that to go further and learn and uh, work together here in a more cohesive manner to actually improve the models and improve these systems. And, um, and, and my, my take has always been, I didn't write the rules on what model we're using, what data we're collecting, how the verification is going to work. I didn't write the rules at continuum. We're just here to help farmers to organize their data where they own it. They're in control of it. They get to choose where it ultimately goes to. I will help to run the scores on it. And with 45Z, it's the GREET model. And that's what's named in the law anyway that they're supposed to use. And so uh, with some of these other protocols or some of these other programs, hey, if we got the same type of data, help us plug it into whatever model you want, whatever you're going to compensate farmers for. I don't care what it is. Just tell us what the model is and uh, how to run it. And we'll, we'll help to get it done. Um but what I was explaining to these companies is if they are going to continue to push on farmers being part of their programs, they're going to likely have to compete against 45Z from a financial yeah. perspective and from an enrollment perspective that farmers can't be in both. And there was a couple different groups that were trying to argue that farmers should be in both. I just personally, at least I've, I've been in this space enough that I think it would be double counting to have farmers in a, carbon credit program insets or offsets plus in the CI program. I think it, I think it would be fairly blatant double counting in my mind, but um, uh, obviously if it, if they allow for it, it's even better for all of us. <laughs> like, hey, I'm all, I would love yeah. that, but I just think it's double counting. Uh, but again, I didn't write the rules. I just, we're just going to help farmers manage their data and participate wherever they want to participate. But um all it was, you know, just boiling down to as the closing keynote after this multi-day conference talking about how they're going to decarbonize their supply chains. And I go in there saying, 
here's this government program coming in. That's way better financial opportunity than anything you're talking. So much easier than anything you're talking. Farmers stay in control. There's no long-term contracts. Uh, kind of freaked them out a little bit, but that was my job too. That's why they wanted me as the closing keynote for this. Um, that uh, these companies are going to need to continue to watch what happens with 45Z. That I think the ripple effect it's going to create is going to be massive. And, and I think these companies can take a page out of this playbook and develop programs that are going to be awesome and more accurate, more verifiable, less fraud, better financially for everybody involved because it's more real. And I think it's going to be better coming out the other side, although there's going to be some disruption here at the beginning. So, yeah, but that's fine. Like you're saying, though, it's going to create some competition too out in the marketplace. And like you said, they're going to have to compete with 45Z. You know, I yeah. obviously have a bias of 45Z too. And I chat about this the last time I was on that a lot of these other carbon programs, I just wasn't a fan of because we had been doing cover crops and no-till for so long that we just straight up didn't qualify for some of these programs or the payment was negligible at that point, you know, next to nothing. So I, I think it's important that, like you're saying, they're going to have to kind of step up in a big way and start swinging yeah. the pot. And, and I mean, just letting the markets operate here, I think that will lead to more money in farmers' pockets. So I think so too. I think so too. And like these companies saying, well, the rules are written this way. We have to use this model and we have to, who says, <laughs> or let's go help these guys fix it. Because if not, you're not going to be meeting your goals because no farmers are going to participate or very few, like not enough to meet your goals are going to stay with some yeah. of these programs. It's it just straight up the math of it. So um, I think they, they're going to have to, so many of these programs are going to have to realize they got to change if they want to be able to compete against this stuff. And is it the, again, is it the best thing ever? Is it the end all be all? No, but, you got to be willing to to change and adjust if you want some of these initiatives to survive. And if you want to meet your real goals, you got to be able to continue to be agile and learn. Uh, and we're of course trying to do the exact same thing and learn and figure out, you know, how, uh, how do we be in best position to help farmers as the game continues to change? Yeah. I mean, obviously this is all built on farmer adoption. So we got to, there's going to be companies like us too, but obviously we're built to assist farmers to, you know, adopt these, these programs or participate in 45 Z. So yeah. I, I hope they get it. I hope they get it right. I hope it can, uh, you know, makes that competition out in the space too, but yeah. obviously still for us, all eyes on 45 Z and, you know, if 45 Z goes, it, it'd be great because all, all waters rise at that point too. So fact, fact. Um, and that's maybe back, uh, blend where you were starting off, um, when I was late coming on, uh, back to farmers, be in position and just at least know kind of what your score is today. Understand the type of data you need to collect. And as we're thinking about the 2025 crop, take super detailed notes, keep a record of every little nitty gritty thing that you do. Cause we don't know exactly how we're going to have to tell this story. We don't know exactly how this is going to have to go through verification. We don't know exactly all the details that are going to need to be collected. So be overly aggressive with collecting data and gathering yeah. details now. And uh, and I think, Blaine, you were sharing, uh, your team is helping farmers get their scores at topsoil.ag. Any farmer can go to it. It's totally free. It takes a couple minutes. And we're running the full re feedstock calculator, not a modified approach. This is the full thing to get your absolute uh ci score uh we start crop by crop you don't have to go detailed on field by field at the very beginning keep it simple just do your uh typical farming practices uh but that's really where you got to start is knowing what type of data to collect what your score is and we've got all that for free at topsoil yeah yeah great point and that's that's really just what I want to drive home today too, is just keeping detailed, accurate records, you know, such as if you're logging applications in some type of field computer, be very specific on, you know, say you have your own sprayer, like be specific in what you're spraying, actually break out the tank mix and don't have total spray rates, you know, just keep good, clean data. Like this is something where having a precision ag background for me, like I'd, I'd love to see this come to fruition so that precision ag can really start paying for itself you know yeah. I, I yeah. mean obviously there's there's things precision ag has helped us with in the past too but i mean this is kind of the next step yeah. in 
journey. So I just really want to drive home to keep really accurate records and be very detailed on what you're doing across that, you know, every pass if you can and across that field and across those acres. Just something really important. We never know what the future might hold. So, you know, even if you haven't been keeping good records in the past, let's start now and let's build to the future on it. Yeah. And uh, you've seen, you know, some of that data record keeping. Obviously, we've got a lot of farmers that are enrolled in CS certification, which is our, our actual verification program. We got a lot of farmers in on that already. We're submitting data to the third party auditors right now. So that first batch of farm data is going to the auditors right now, which is great. Uh, moving the ball forward. I don't know of any other uh, program similar to ours that is going through a third party audit. So, uh, so we're excited to be the first ones and try to uh, keep moving all this forward to get farmers independently uh, audited based on their practices and based on their, their CI scores. Uh, it's been a heck of a, a process there. And Blaine, you've been involved. Uh, we joke that sometimes everyone at Continuum Mag is on the ops team, <laughs> even if you're, uh, even if uh, your job title is not necessarily a, an agronomist or an operations person, but it's been all hands on deck to get all that data pulled together. And you've seen, you know, some farmers, their data is really clean and it's super easy for us to get all that pulled in. Other farmers, uh, not as much. So that's why we're saying, hey, make it easier on your on yourself, make it easier on us, make it cheaper and faster for all of us by collecting good records when you're out in the fields, when you're making the applications, or even before, set yourself up for success by taking really good records, make sure that things are working correctly because it's going to take that third-party audit uh, to put you in best position to maximize the potential financial returns. Yeah, and I... I have been involved, not to the extent that some of our team members, people here at Continuum have been, and they've been busting on everything here, just working like crazy. But I, I think the thing to keep in mind, I guess, just from the farmer standpoint, somebody that's went through an actual audit for, for tax wise, you got to keep in mind of who's, this is a tax credit program, right? So in my opinion, and putting the farmer cap on here, like keeping detailed, very clean records is going to is going to do you a lot of good in the long run too. If something gets pulled and they, you know, they end up looking through uh, a certain farmer. Right. So just yeah. having the receipts, you know, that having everything there and being organized would make that process go a lot smoother. So, yeah. Yeah. I like it. Um, Blaine, anything, anything to wrap up here? No, I just, I would say that, you know, in this step right now, as we're waiting on things, just at the minimum, go get those bushels scored at topsoil.ag. Our team is more than happy to, you know, help go through that process too. There's some resources out there that team members have created to, you know, go through a video and watch how to go through the farm profile and actually score things out. So try and utilize that, but we're always here to help too. So give us a call anytime and yeah. we're more than happy to go through it. Well, and just a great way to be connected with one of our uh, folks individually. Um, but as we're saying it, looks like we're going to make some substantial progress towards maybe some rules or some more clarity here. So stay tuned, tuned in uh, to stuff we're doing. Uh, we'll have some adjusted schedules here as we go into uh, into the holidays and all that and end of the year. But uh, everyone appreciate you hanging out with us here today and uh, we'll see. Hopefully this thing uh, keeps happening the way that we want it to. It's going to be awesome and, and we're going to be ready for it. So, and, and we appreciate you all being at the forefront of this as well. Have a great Tuesday and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Mitch. Bye everyone.